Ladies and gentlemen, may I crave your attention for a few moments? Moments well spent, my friends, to show you something, a phenomenon, the like of which you may travel the old world over and never see again. In London, in the 1880s, a strange misshapen figure appeared in a small carnival sideshow. The Elephant Man, a grotesque freak of human nature. And yet, he started out in life just like you and me. But one day, while visiting a traveling circus, his poor mother, a fine, delicate creature, six months with child, was terrified by a packy girl. A elephant to you, sir. The consequence of this overwhelming misfortune, I'm about to show you now. Don't let this wonderful educational opportunity pass you by. Would you kindly step away, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, thank you. Who was the Elephant Man? And what caused his grotesque appearance? presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In the London of the 1880s, horse-drawn carriages of the rich were never to be seen in areas like Whitechapel Road, which was, as Dickens might have described it, filthy, festering, and overhung with the smell of decay tottering rows of blighted housing, an abundance of unwashed children, where the only escape was to be found in a bottle. Although the finest hospital in London was in this area, there were still large gaps in medical knowledge. Poverty-bred diseases rarely surprised the doctors of London Hospital. John Merrick's case came to the attention of Dr. Frederick Treves, later, the physician of Edward VII. His account of the Merrick case is a classic in medical literature. The words are taken from his actual notes. I first saw John Merrick, or the Elephant Man, as he became known, in November of 1884. One of my junior house surgeons had seen an exhibition of freaks in a disused warehouse off the Whitechapel Road very near the London Hospital where I worked. The afternoon I went, I found the exhibition temporarily closed. I, uh, I asked who the proprietor was and where I might find him. I sought him out and we struck a bargain. He would give me a private showing for the payment of one shilling. We went into the warehouse, which was very cold, very dank. We went through numerous passages, up many stairs. Governor. First, I couldn't quite see him. He was just a hunched figure in the, in the distance. And as we got closer, he turned to me and revealed himself to be one of the most disgusting specimens of humanity it's ever been my misfortune to lay eyes upon. The proprietor said to him rather harshly, as if speaking to a dog. Stand up! This poor man stood up. 
You know, in my profession, as a doctor, I have seen many gross deformities and mutilations. But I can honestly say, never before or since, have I seen a more pathetic, disgusting spectacle from poor John Merrick. This is the skeleton of the... The curator of the London Medical Museum, Percy Nunn, discusses the actual skeleton of John Merrick. The fact that he had this terrifically grotesque appearance caused by the multiple growth of uh, both bony uh, tissue and also of the skin. Although he seems to be short in stature, this was attributed to the fact that he did have a scoliosis or curvature of the spine which produced his height by at least six inches. And also, the pelvic basin is twisted in such a manner that uh, he became uh, quite a cripple. He has this growth of bone on the head and down the right-hand side of the skeleton. The cast itself was taken when Merrick died, and the cast is a true replica of the way he looked during the time that he was alive. The jaw of the elephant man is inclined to the right. And it was here that the first formation of bony growth manifested itself about the age of four and a half years. During the time he reached the age of 11, the whole of the head, including the forehead, began to show signs of these bony growths. This is a cast taken at death of the elephant man's left hand, as you see there. And you will notice that this is almost a normal hand, as against the right hand, which is here, and this is where the disease really took place. The right foot, which I have here, was also grossly deformed. Dr. Trees recalls the disquieting effect John Merrick had on him. I couldn't get the, the experience out of my mind. And I went back and I confronted the showman. You don't seem to realize if it hadn't been for me giving him employment, where would he be? He'd be in the workhouse shoveling stones. When I took him in, he had nothing. I took him in out of the kindness of my heart. I'm a kind hearted man myself. I've been like a father to him. No, no, I became very angry. I was disgusted with the way that poor John Merrick was living. He was living in absolute filth and squalor. And he was being exploited by this man. And time had come to do something about it. So we took him away. I decided after a while that the best course would be for me to provide John Merrick with a home of sorts and some sort of security. It wasn't altogether an uh, altruistic decision. I, as an anatomist, wanted to study him from a medical point of view. Dr. Treves admitted this man himself. The head nurse remembers. Which I found rather audacious of him, although I suppose he had his own reasons. Initially, I felt rather annoyed, or well, very annoyed, in fact, because, in fact, it was irregular, most irregular. We have very strict rules here, made for very good reasons. One of our main rules is that we do not admit incurables. We just simply cannot afford the beds, nor our nurses' precious time. We have many casualties here. We have industrial accidents. We have to have a certain number of beds always vacant. We provided him with a room in the London Hospital. And he lived there, I think, in relative peace until he died. When I saw the face for the first time, that's something I would rather forget, and I put it to the back of my mind, because I was almost physically sick. And as a trained and experienced nurse, one is not proud of that. 
One has seen accidents, one has seen terrible sights, but this was something quite indescribable. One could not help but being deeply affected by this case, this particular case, because here was a man we could have turned away. And here was someone that indeed we could help. He was incurable, but that doesn't mean to say you can't help people. John Merrick lived for three years at the London hospital. Dr. Treves visited him often, constantly bringing books which opened up a magic world of make-believe to his patient, who began to construct miniatures which he proudly presented to visitors. He must have had the most horrific mental troubles to bear, knowing what he looked like. I believe that his coming into our hospital helped not only himself, but all those around us. It widened our own experience. It certainly widened mine. And in the end, I felt rather ashamed of my initial reaction. The circumstances of John Merrick's death were a little puzzling to us at the time. You see, John Merrick, because of the size of his head, had to sleep sitting up with his head resting on his knees. When we found him, he was lying flat on the bed, and as a consequence, he'd suffocated. Now, whether it was a deliberate act of suicide, or whether it was a pathetic attempt on his part to try to live some sort of a normal life and sleep like a normal human being, we will never know. But he was dead when we found him. And Although it was tragic, and he'd made many friends while he was here at the London Hospital, I felt that we'd made the last few years of his life a little better than it would have been if he'd remained where he was. When John Merrick, the Elephant Man, died, he was thought to be a singular, hideous aberration of nature. Yet today, 100,000 people in the United States alone are victims of the Elephant Man disorder, neurofibromatosis. It is John Merrick's suffering that has called attention to their affliction, something society has tried to hide. How does anyone afflicted with this disorder cope with it today? The Elephant Man's disorder is discussed by Dr. Alan Rubenstein. John Merrick, who was the Elephant Man, had an extraordinary case of neurofibromatosis with extensive overgrowth of tissues surrounding the neurofibromas. He really represents one end of a wide spectrum of this disorder. The disorder can range from a benign syndrome in which only a few lesions are present to people who have more severe involvement of the skin and more seriously growths of deeper areas of the body, which can lead to blindness, deafness, and spinal cord uh, paralysis. Neurofibromatosis is not a rare disorder. The incidence is approximately 50 per 100,000, which means that 100,000 Americans are affected with this disorder. That makes it as common as muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis or other diseases which many people have heard of. I started to get panicked when I was about in my 20s, late 20s, and I suddenly realized that something wasn't quite right. Irene Smith has additional symptoms. Ketosis. And then I started to get falling about, losing my sense of balance. They x-rayed my head, and they said I've got one growing on the eight cranial nerve of the head, which is obviously going to throw me off my balance, and there's also one in my right ear, and that would also help me to lose my sense of balance. I never know I'm going to fall. I can be standing on the curb, go to take a step forward and I'm flat on my face. When you go into a dress shop, you don't want the assistant in the cubicle with you. Say, no, thank you, I can manage on my own. Because you feel very embarrassed in case they think their dresses might be contaminated or something like that. And I'm very careful how I choose my dresses. I always make sure that I never buy a sleeveless dress or a see-through blouse or anything with a plunging neckline. I always make sure that my arms are either half covered or fully covered if I can. It's not always possible to get the clothes that you want, and I don't make my own clothes. Otherwise, I would always make we go around dressed like a nun, <laughs> just because that's how you feel, that you want to cover yourself up as much as possible. 
This 58-year-old man who demonstrates the most common lesion in neurofibromatosis, which is the dermal neurofibroma. They are usually multiple, more common on the torso, and usually break the skin and uh, present as, uh, as multiple nodules, which are usually painless. They can range in number from a few to literally thousands. These lesions are composed of nerve cells and fibrous tissue, hence the term neurofibroma. The disorder is genetic. It's a function of an abnormality in the chromosomes of an individual. The precise location of the abnormality and how to identify it are as yet undetermined. Plastic surgery is a partial answer. Over the past several years, we've done dozens of surgical procedures in which patients under general anesthesia has extensive removal of his skin lesions. And the results in general have been quite good. I used to have many large ones, similar to those that I have on my body, on my face. And the uh, foundation had a doctor, Simon, that, uh, a plastic surgeon, and he removed them, and it really picked me up a lot, changed my attitude a lot. As a social worker, my primary concern is the impact... Penny Schwartz, Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. ...of a genetic neurological disorder on patients' and families' lives. And one of the things that the NF patient family group tries to do is to provide an atmosphere to talk about how they feel. Do people ever say nasty things to no, you? No, nobody has ever said anything nasty to me, but I, I, I do know and that people just mm. are continually staring, and eventually, if the stare lasts for more than five or ten seconds, you eventually do feel extremely mm. self-conscious. I always had a very large, uh, big, red, floppy tumor on my left shoulder that I had had since birth, and as I was growing older, the tumor itself <clears throat> developed and grew. And to that point, I was very self-conscious about it, and when I used to go to the beach or any other place like that during the summer where you could indeed go topless, I would always be very conscious of that and wear a very dark shirt so that the tumor would not show through. My main area of frustration and concern is lack of knowledge on the part of physicians. Uh, I've known for some time what I have, but the physicians with whom I spoke and my family history all seem to indicate that it was nothing more than neurofibromas. It wasn't until our, our two sons were born that I realized it was much more. One doctor said to me, it's no big deal. I look at my son, he has tumors, and I feel so uh, helpless, uh, not being able to do anything. And at one point, I was getting upset over uh, watching these tumors come out and not knowing how many or where they're going to hit. Now I pray that... Uh, that they don't hit in the vital areas. It is totally unpredictable. He has his years ahead of him where he has his puberty, he has his 20s to go through, his 30s. Nobody can tell me. And I can sit back and say, dear God, help me. There's nothing you can do. Uh, when the elephant man was playing in town, someone looked at me, a young boy, and looked at his friend and said, ha, ah, there's Mrs. Merrick. All of us know how important touch is. When people touch you, you know, like that, how does it feel? Does it hurt physically sometimes? Yes, it hurts when they touch me. It depends where they touch me or how hard they touch me, it hurts. Sometimes I want to hug somebody, but looking like I am, I'm afraid to because I don't know how they will react. What are you afraid will happen, Porter? They will be repulsed. I've had people look at me and back away in horror. You know, it might not only be that they may be, feel repulsed, but they might feel that it's contagious, but it's not. Like when we have a social gathering and people come in and they kiss each other, like I always kind of wait for them to approach me first. And if I see them approach me, then I will, I, I can already tell the sign if they're going to approach me. If they don't, I just give them a smile and not make them feel uncomfortable. I have a different perspective. Uh, I'm a parent. I don't have NF myself. But as, li as I was listening to you and to Porter and to... June before, and especially to June before, I had another thought, and it was that all of us, my daughter and you and June and Porter, are bigger than NF. And, and I'm, that's not the same thing as saying that it's nothing much.
It is a great deal. But I know that if I give in to the anxiety, I could not live a contributing, happy life, and my daughter can't either. And so the, you have to go beyond mm -hmm. that. My daughter is more than her neurofibromatosis. All of us are. And the fact that we are here and functioning and working shows this. The Legacy of the Elephant Man. The tragic life of the elephant man has attracted the attention of the world to his disorder. The importance of research on neurofibromatosis extends far beyond the fact that 100,000 people have this disorder. The incidence of mental retardation, epilepsy, and cancer, three very common health problems in the United States, are much higher in people with neurofibromatosis than in the normal population. Research on the mechanisms by which neurofibromatosis produces these problems may very well lead clues to clues about these other major health problems. The first purpose is to provide information. Joan Rudd is president of the National Neurofibromatosis Foundation. In the 100 years since Dr. von Recklinghausen first described neurofibromatosis, scant little has been learned about the disorder. Whatever progress, whatever information was learned, about neurological diseases in, in general. There was no way for uh, a com communication to be promoted internationally readily. The foundation seems to have filled that need. Doctors from all over the country and all over the world in all specialties have a structure within which to communicate. For information concerning neurofibromatosis, write NF. 180 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10024.